A spoiler minimizing tutorial video for role player adventures. Come on back after the break. Hey everybody, welcome to the show, Board Game Reviews. This is a YouTube video dedicated to the tabletop gaming hobby, and this video is part of a video series looking at the game of role player adventures. Now in this video, I'm gonna teach you how to play the game. Now in this video, I'm not gonna go all crazy town like I did with Time Stories, where I actually made a complete adventure up just to teach how to play the game without any spoilers. In this video, I'm gonna do as spoiler minimized as possible. I'm gonna show you how everything's set up, how skill checks work, how to fight monsters and do all that good stuff, but I'm not gonna do it by pulling out the storybooks. I'm gonna make stuff up and hopefully that'll give you the idea of exactly what things do mean and how the game works itself. So again, my whole objective of this tutorial video is to teach you how to play the game with the fewest amount of spoilers, but I am emphasizing the fewest. You're gonna see a few things in this tutorial video. You're gonna see a monster, but you won't know where the monster is gonna pop out at. You're gonna see a skill check, but you don't see where the skill check is gonna occur at. So it's not really super spoilery. But I'm gonna teach you how to play the full campaign game, meaning we're gonna set up our campaign sheet, we're gonna pick our characters, and we're gonna go through how to play the game. What I am not gonna cover in this game is I'm not gonna teach you how to play a character that you're gonna pull out of the role player dice game. Two reasons why I'm not gonna do that. One, I don't think it's gonna be part of what people want from this video because not everybody owns that game. And second of all, it would require you to actually understand a lot of the concepts from another game. And that's just beyond the scope of this video. So that's enough of the introduction here. Let's go and teach you how to play the game of role-playing adventures with the very first thing that we need to do, which is gonna be the campaign setup, which starts us with a campaign tracker. So let's go and go over this and show you how to make your characters and start playing the game of role-player adventures. Now, before we go any further and before I forget, I am gonna include the Codex expansion, which is the backstories. I'm pretty much assuming anybody who bought Role Player Adventures bought the backstory expansion because, well, it adds more to the game and you're, you, you definitely want it, trust me. I play this game enough to know that the backstory adventures are gonna add a lot more to the replay. I mean, this game, basic, just look in the basic box here, you're looking at about two good playthroughs for the game. The Adventure Codex is gonna probably double that for you because you're gonna see a whole bunch of backstories where it's gonna influence things in the game and you'll wanna pick it up, trust me on this one. So the very first thing we need to do is when we're starting the game is we're gonna start a campaign. And since this is a campaign game, there's a little bit of prep that we need to go through before we actually enter the game proper. So let's go ahead and cover that prep, that prep stuff. The very first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take our dice bag and we're gonna fill this up with all the dice. Now these are the dice that come in the six colors and these are gonna be the dice we're gonna use for basically everything we're doing in the game. From skill checks, from combat, to trying to accomplish our various different goals, we're gonna be using those dice. And since this is a dice manipulation game, we're gonna be doing our darndest to play cards, to use special abilities, to go ahead and manipulate those dice to make sure we're succeeding on the skill checks, succeeding on those combats so we can advance, advance the story. Of course, the nice thing about the way the story is designed, failure is not the end of the game. Matter of fact, you can actually die in this game. Die, knocked unconscious, multiple times. At least 10 times before anything super really bad happens to you. So you can pretty much stumble your way through the story. This game is very forgiving. This game is first and foremost a story game. Secondary, it is a dice manipulation game. You fail the dice manipulation, you're still gonna have fun, you're still gonna see storyline, and you're still gonna unlock everything. Matter of fact, there are some story events, I'll cover this in my review, where failing might actually be the better decision because it's gonna affect your storyline. Trust me, you'll see what I mean when you start playing this game. Not gonna go any further down that rabbit hole because spoiler minimized. So now that we got our dice bag ready, we need to prepare our campaign journal. Now the campaign journal is gonna be required every single time you start a brand new campaign. This is the first thing you're gonna do. And second thing you're gonna do is create your character. So the first thing we need to do with our campaign journal is we need to fill out a couple of these boxes on this campaign journal. And the boxes we're gonna fill out is gonna be based on our player count. And let me correct myself, on our hero count. Because while you play this game as a true solo game, one player controlling one hero, I highly, highly recommend you play at least two heroes on this game. I'll cover that also in my review, but trust me on this one, play two heroes. You're gonna have a lot more fun. The story's gonna feel much more, that's yeah, called organic. But the first thing we wanna do is we're gonna start filling out some things on the campaign tracker. If we're playing a one player game, we're gonna put our play limit down as four. If we're doing a two player game, our play limit is gonna be two. If we're doing a three player game, our player limit is one. And of course, if we're playing a four player game, our play limit is gonna be one. For this tutorial video itself, I am going to be assuming that we're doing a one player game. 
Again, I don't suggest this. I'm just telling you what's what we're going to do for this demo video right here. So what we're going to do is we're going to fill out our play limit. Since we're playing a one-player game, we're going to put the number four in here to signify our current play limit. Now, this is going to affect how many cards we can play every single action, skill check, combat round, whatever we want to say. That's the max amount of cards we get plus our bonus play. This will all make much more sense when we get to that point. Next up, we want to fill in our bonus play limit. Now, the bonus play limit is going to be one unless we're playing a three-player game. So one, two, or four players, bonus limit is one. Three players is two. I'm showing a one-player game, so it's going to put number one here in our limit to signify how many extra cards we can play by one and only one player every skill or combat. The final thing we're going to fill out here is going to be our combat limit, and this is going to be three depending on one, two, three, or four players, doesn't matter. Our combat dice limit is always going to be three. Of course, nice thing about this is make sure you're doing all this in pencil because while this is a campaign tracker, like your character sheet, it's going to be changing. Pencil is going to be your friend here. Now that we've got our character sheet basically started, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to make our character. So to make our character, there's going to be a little character sheet you're going to slide in here on these dual layered boards. And these need to be lined up in a way that you can see the various different colors and you can write in on these right here. Now, I use photocopies, and the reason why I'm doing this is because this is not my copy of the game. I am borrowing a friend's copy of the game because they were a Kickstarter backer, and I was not for this one. And trust me, the real character sheets fit in here a heck of a lot better. These photocopies are just using standard paper. Trust me, it works a lot cleaner because it's actually a little bit thicker cardstock. Again, not my copy of the game, so I'm not destroying any of these components because I don't own this game. So we're going to slide in our character sheet right in here, and then we need to start figuring out what kind of character we're going to play, get their name and all their different abilities. Again, we're going to use the pre-generated characters here, and this game does come with multiple pre-generated characters. Now, there's a whole bunch of characters in here if you decide to bring in your character from role player itself. Since we're not going to do that, we are going to remove all of these. We are not going to use these in the sample gameplay at all. What we need to do is we need to go through this entire deck of cards and find the character that we want to play most. I'm going to pick this character right here. Why? Because I haven't played him yet and his backstory looks really darn funny and really darn awesome. And it's kind of a cool picture too. I actually like it. So we're going to take this information and this is going to tell us a whole bunch of different things and we're going to transfer this information over to our character sheet. Most important thing we want to start transferring over first is we're going to figure out our statistics. Now we're going to write our statistics don't touch you'll stop spinning we're gonna write our statistics in here so we have a strength of two we have a dex of zero again mr pencil is your friend here we have a constitution of two we have an intelligence of zero a wisdom of three and a charisma of one our name is shameric steel shell i'm just going to call myself shameric shameric shamazo hazafest and course paraded no i did not just do that i just totally went there didn't i yes that shell was older than me it really is so player name is going to be me, again, me, myself, and Irene. Our race is going to be Saurian. Spelling matters. Our class is going to be Templar. And our health is going to be 16. Now your statistics are going to be different depending on which character you're going to pick from the pre-generated characters, but your health is always going to be starting at 16. Doesn't matter which character you're playing, they all start with 16 health. The only way to start with a higher health is to bring in one of your characters from the role player dice manipulation game. So since we're not covering that for this video, we're going to go and skip that. Health is always going to be 16. Next thing we need to figure out is our class is going to be the patrician. So let's go ahead and look through all the various classes in the game and figure out exactly which character that is going to be. And I could cheat and look at my color. It should be, oh wait, sorry, my mistake. That's my backstory. I almost got ahead of myself. My class is actually Templar, which is white. So my class is Templar. Matches up right there. We'll flip this over and this is going to be our ability that's going to be usable one time between rests. Every time we rest, it's going to refresh itself. And that is basically the only thing that we need to worry about here. Now, since I am going to cover the expansion backstory book, we want to make sure we're going to also grab one of the backstory sheets right here. And these backstories are going to give us our personal goals, our adventures where we're going to get our own special adventures, and we're also going to adjust our alignment. As we adjust our alignment, it's going to give us special powers because our alignment is going to give us more cards to play. Again, the cards are how we're manipulating the dice, so it behooves you to use the backgrounds. I'm not going to lie, the backgrounds does make the game a little bit easier, but the stories they add are definitely worth the trade-off. I mean, I mean it's easier because you're getting more cards. More cards makes the game easier because the more cards you have, the more dice manipulation you do. You should kind of make sense to you why it's going to be easier. but. Let's go and pick our backstory. Our backstory we're going to see is listed right down here on the card. It's going to be Patrician, 
So we will write patrician. And then we're gonna pull out the background book and it's gonna tell us which one of the stories we're gonna get our own special story. And so let's go ahead and pull that out and show you exactly how that looks. Whenever you get your backstory, the first thing you wanna do is read your backstory out loud to all the players at the table. Again, this is gonna to add to the story and the theme of the game. And then we're gonna look down here for all the different, various different adventures where we are gonna get our own personal story that's gonna evolve. So we see that during adventure two, at location D, we're gonna get our special storyline. Adventure four, location E, special storyline. Adventure five, location C, and finally adventure seven and location B, we're gonna get a special storyline. The way these special storylines are going to occur is anytime we go to location, the location will always occur first. Once we get to the point of any location where it says, do you want to move? Once it says that in any part of any storylines, that is immediately what we're gonna go ahead and resolve our own personal adventure. So we see that we're going for adventure 2D. So we're simply gonna take our board right here and we are gonna write 2D as a reminder, 4E, 5C, and finally 7B. And then the next thing we need to do is we need to get our personal tokens out and we're gonna use these to track our alignment and we're gonna get our personal book, which is gonna be a reminder for us when the stories are going to occur where we will get some kind of modification of some kind. So let's go and put our alignment tracker right there and we will take our story token right here. And what we're gonna do with the story token is when we get to Adventure 2, we're simply gonna place this book on Location D as a nice reminder, reminding us that when we go there, we are going to get our own personal story. Now as we go through our own personal story, we're gonna get some choices. Again, I'm trying to minimize the spoilers here, but we're gonna get some choices where it's gonna say, go to section one, to section two, section three, section four, as we're going through this storyline. Again, I'm not gonna show it, spoiler minimize here, but as we're gonna go through that, it's gonna give us a little arrow and it's gonna tell us to adjust our alignment. Every time we do that, we're gonna do that based on our choices. It may be an up arrow, down arrow, left arrow, right arrow, and every time that happens, we're simply gonna move our, our alignment cube to the various different locations. Additionally, as we're moving our alignment cube, that's gonna unlock these rare cards right here that are gonna be associated with our alignment. These rare cards, generally speaking, are gonna go into our hand, giving us the extra cards, are gonna give us extra action but to manipulate the dice. And again, all we gotta do is just go through the storyline. It's nice and easy, super simple. You're gonna unlock it, get extra cards, extra powers. It's a really cool addition to the basic storyline. I highly, highly recommend when you're playing role player adventures, get the expansion and play with the game right from the beginning. It's gonna make a great choice and a lot of good benefits. Next up, we just need to finish building up our characters here. There's a couple things we need to do. First, we need to get these stamina cubes for every one of our statistics that's greater than zero. Now, you should have eight statistic stamina cubes because all these characters are pretty much based around the number eight. But if you transferred a character in from role player adventures, you could have statistics as low as six or all the way up to 10. Generally speaking, you're probably gonna be on that higher range because the characters do come over from there a little bit more powerful than your basic standard characters, which is another reason why I highly, highly suggest you use the pre-generated characters. Yes, it's cool to transfer over characters. Yes, that's a cool idea, but most of your characters are gonna come over much more powerful than these basic characters, making the game a lot easier right at the beginning. So you see that we have two stamina, so we're gonna put two cubes in our stamina. We have zero dexterity, ignore it. We have two constitution, two cubes of constitution, zero intelligence, we have three in wisdom, and we have one in charisma. Now there's two different sizes of cubes in the game. The bigger ones represent three of anything. The smaller ones represent one stamina. Generally speaking, in your attribute row, you're gonna use the singles. In your fatigue row, you're gonna use the larger ones when you need to make change. Most of the time in a one and two player game, you'll never need to make change. In a three and four player game, that's probably gonna happen a little bit more often. So now that we have our statistics in there, the only thing we're left to do is get our starting hand of cards. Now our starting hand of cards, again, is gonna be based on our pre-generated character we have right here, and it's gonna be listed right here. And we're simply gonna take the cards that come with the game and we're gonna go through and grab those cards. For example, we see that I'm gonna start with the Blessed Mace and I'm gonna start with the Tower Shield. There's the Blessed Mace and I just need to go through here, find the Tower Shield, nice and done. Super duper easy, not that hard to do. Next up, we are gonna have our trait cards. We see that the traits I have is obnoxious. Well, that's just perfect. I'm just, I think it's just more fun than even everything I was thinking before. So I get to be the obnoxious, Patrician, Templar, wow, in a D&D game, I would be playing this guy totally to the hilt. So next up we have is our skill cards. We are gonna start with the skills of Tumble. A little bit dexterous, so that means we're gonna be covering quite a bit. So it looks like this guy is going to be fairly well balanced in the beginning, which could be really nice. Scroll we're gonna get is Exile and Tremor.
Tremor and Exile. Exile is actually really super nice. Gets you an extra die whenever you need one. And it comes out as a three, so you can't beat that at all. Finally, Armor. We have Chain Gorget. There we go. So this is gonna be our complete hand of cards and these are the cards that we are gonna start with. Of course, we're gonna gain more cards as we go through by spending our money and going on adventures, loving up our characters. But this is our basic hand of cards. So your basic hand of cards is, they tell you to keep it face down over here on the hand section of your player board. Your discard is gonna go here and your spent cards are gonna go right here. They say keep it face down. I think the only reason why they do that is just to make sure you don't confuse your piles because you're gonna be looking at these cards all the time and you're not gonna draw this hand this hand is your full hand at all times. So you can keep it face up if you like, it's not gonna matter. Now let's go back to our campaign tracker because there's a couple more things we need to do. On our campaign tracker, we need to put out our cubes that are gonna track our current mount of alliance or faction with the various different factions in the game. There's three factions, there's the King's Favor, there's the Starlit Door, and then there's Dra the Dragul Favor. Now anytime your faction goes up, you're gonna crease it this way. Anytime your faction goes down, it's gonna go this way. Various different story elements are gonna ask you what your current faction level is. For example, it's gonna say, is your starlit level at four or higher? If it is, you're gonna to go to section A of the book. If your faction is currently four, three or lower, then you go to section C of the book. So you make sure you're constantly tracking your faction at all times. Additionally, your faction is gonna go up and down based on your decisions. And if your faction ever needs to go beyond 10 or if it ever needs to go below minus 10 on either one of these tracks, for every point it needs to go above or below that, instead of moving the track, you're simply going to get one point of experience for the difference. So for example, if my Starlet faction is currently at level 10 and I do an action that says gain three points of faction with a Starlet door, since my faction is already topped off, instead of doing that, I'm simply going to go ahead and grab three experience points. And then experience points are tracked with these blue cubes. You'll just simply put the blue cubes right there. And experience points are used for resting. They're also used for leveling up your characters at the end of every single adventure. It's probably a good time to go over our adventure book really quick for a campaign tracker, just to cover a couple really quick items, just so you understand how it works when we get to that point. Experience is gonna be tracked with cubes. You're gonna place it right here on any unspent experience at the end of every single adventure. You're simply gonna write down here in the save category. Gold you're accumulating to keep right here. And as you go through the adventure, you're gonna gain more gold. And at the end of every single venture, you're just gonna track how much gold you're gonna save over the course of the campaign. Anytime you gain a title, titles are gonna come across as cards. You're gonna stack up these cards in the titles section right here. You never lose titles. When you get a title, it's stuck with you for the rest of the campaign. Whereas opposed to keywords, when you get a keyword, you're gonna write it down in the section. There are no cards for keywords. You're simply gonna write it down. You're gonna keep that keyword for the entire adventure you're on, not the campaign. Titles last for the campaign, adventure, I'm sorry, keywords only last for the adventure. At the end of every single adventure, when you're visiting the market and spend your experience points, just have somebody at the table go ahead and erase all your keywords. They never carry over. Just make sure you're covering your tracks right here. Your mastery track right here is gonna allow you to increase the statistics of your characters by spending experience points. You're gonna track which campaign as you go through the adventures and you're gonna track your deaths over here. Every time you die, you're gonna mark off one of the deaths, pull out the storybook section for the death, read that section of the death, which is gonna tell you what's gonna happen and you're gonna carry on from there. The important thing to understand about this death track is it's really an unconscious track. And it's only gonna occur when the entire party is knocked unconscious. If you're playing with a four player game and three players knocked unconscious and one player does the Hail Mary, defeats the bad guy and nobody's knocked unconscious, you're not gonna knock off on the unconscious track. It's gonna happen a lot more when you're playing a one hero game. In a four player game, you guessed it, it's probably not gonna happen for the entire campaign. Not a good thing, not a bad thing. It's just probably the way it is with the difficulty level of the game. Along with the campaign setup, which you only have to do one time at the start of every single campaign, every single adventure has its own specific setup. Now again, minimizing spoilers, so I'm not gonna pull out the book here, but basically, this book right here is gonna have some thematic text on the back, quickly flip it over so you don't see it. And then at the first page, it's gonna give you a whole bunch of special setup instructions, including which specific map you're gonna use. Again, all these maps are double-sided. There's some terms down here which are gonna tell you which well, basically which map you're gonna use. Also, you're gonna notice some symbols around the edge. You're gonna have a symbol and then a Roman numeral across the top. Those are gonna be very important because you're gonna have discovery cards that are gonna come out that are gonna modify the map. If you get a discovery card that is a map piece, you're gonna place it in whatever section it needs to go in. In the lower left-hand corner of every single discovery card, you're gonna see the symbol and a numeric Num Roman numeral, sorry, which is gonna show you which section of the map it's gonna go into, and that's gonna modify the map, possibly add in different locations, everything along those lines. 
You're also going to be told where you're going to start your adventuring party, which is represented with this miniature that shows two heroes on it. Yes, the game does play up to four players, but our adventuring party apparently is always two players. Next up, we're going to be told to take a couple of these tokens as a randomizer. Now, these tokens right here are specifically going to be associated with the adventure book right here, which is going to be the Tome of Encounters. These go to the Tome of Encounters. These different locations right here are going to be affiliated with this actual adventure book. So, for example, no spoilers really here. The very first adventure is going to tell you to take two of these tokens, place them face down, randomize them, and you're going to place them on these various different locations right here. Anytime a player, while they're traveling along these paths, have ever crossed one of these adventure tokens, you're simply going to flip over that adventure token, and then you're going to pull out the Book of Encounters, and you're going to pull into the specific section of the Book of Encounters. I keep calling Book of Encounters, it's technically the Tome of Encounters. Okay, sorry. So basically what you're going to do is you look for the section that's based on your current adventure and the numeric number that you revealed. So there are 11 different adventures in the game. So if you're an adventure number one, you're going to go to section one, which is adventure one, find section number one. If I had revealed this token right here because I decided to go that direction, I'm going to go to adventure one, section number two. I'm going to read the text out loud and it's going to give me some options based on an if then scenario or a whole bunch of question marks. Basically, if you see an exclamation mark, it's an if then scenario. If you see question marks, you're going to make a choice of exactly what you want to do. And again, that's going to be different based on different adventures. So the bottom line here is if you see these little tokens right here, Tome of Adventures. If you see this lettered locations, it's going to be the book of adventures for the specific adventure right here. Additionally, what you also need to do is you're going to seed every one of these locations, generally speaking, with one experience token on every one of these lettered specific locations. It'll tell you to do this in the introduction for the adventure. If it doesn't tell you to do this, then don't do it. But if it tells you to do that, you're going to put one of those experience tokens down all those locations. It's also going to tell you what location you're going to start in, most likely, and it's also going to tell you to make sure you're updating your campaign tracker. And the way we're going to update our campaign tracker is going to be over on the campaign tracker sheet where if we have any saved experience, we're going to erase it and put that many experience cubes right here in the starting section. So if I had a number four right here, I would erase it and put four blue cubes right here. If I had any gold saved over left over from the prior venture, I'm going to erase and put that many gold coins right here. So if I had two saved gold, I'm going to erase it. I'm going to place two gold right here, right then. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to put our rest token out here face up. It is double sided. The back side shows an X, which means you cannot rest. And the front side shows the tent without the X, meaning that rest is available to you. Then you're going to find out how many bonus play tokens you're allowed, and you're going to put that many bonus play tokens over here in the bonus play section. Now, the difference between the play limit and the bonus play limit is every single player on this adventure can play that many cards on every single encounter, every skill check, or every combat round. And this is a bonus play that's usable by one player and one player only. And when they take it, they're going to spend this token and they're going to put it over here on their fatigue counter, which allows them to play one more card beyond the play limit. Again, it's only the character who takes this token can break that rule. Everybody else is stuck with a play limit for that specific campaign that you're playing. Again, that's going to be based on the player count. Now, the game itself is going to play out like a gigantic choose your own adventure book with multiple books that's going to tell you this grand story across this grand campaign. So there's a couple of core concepts you really need to understand. And again, minimizing spoilers, but you just need to understand it. The way the game is going to play out is we're going to be reading from a journal, whether it's a Tome of Adventures, where it's our current adventure journal, or maybe it's our backstory journal, whatever it happens to be, we're basically going to be reading a section of that story. And the section of the story that we're going to be reading is going to be based on whether directions were given from the locations we're going to visit or various things happening because of our backstory. For example, if we have our backstory token that happens to be right here, and we as our party manage to get to this location after encountering all this stuff, and after we encounter this specific location, it's going to give us the option to maybe move away from this location. Before we do so, we're going to have our special story encounter. So it's going to tell us to go to various different books, and basically we're going to be bouncing back and forth between three books. The Tome of Adventures, the main adventure book for this, and also the background story book. Those are the three books we want to keep handy because those are the books we're reading through. Every one of these books is going to basically have two different kind of sections. You're going to have one section that's going to be a whole bunch of question marks, and it's going to give you options next to every single question mark. When you get one of those encounter areas, you're just going to pick one of the question marks, do what that question mark says, and you're basically going to move on. Maybe you're going to be moved to another section of the story. Maybe it's going to give you the option to move to another location. Maybe it's going to give you the option to rest. Or maybe it's going to give you various different things. The other section you're going to be getting is maybe an encounter that's going to show an exclamation mark. Whenever you get an exclamation mark, it's going to be a series of events, and it's going to tell you if A is occurring, 
stop and do what A says. If A is not occurring, go to B. If B is occurring, do exactly what B says. Do not go any further down this list. And you're gonna basically look at your titles, look at your keywords, look at everything that's going on in the various statuses of the game, and you're gonna stop immediately when you get to that point. So let's go ahead and use an example of exactly how this is gonna work. Let's clean up this map just a little bit so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Let's say we had started at this location right here on the map, and we have encountered that location, and we traveled through here, we encountered this through the Book of Adventures, and we decided to move to this location. Once we get to this location, we're gonna open to adventure book number section C of the adventure for this specific adventure. And we're gonna go to C and the first thing it's going to say is if there's no experience token in this location, go to section C1. Well, we see there's an experience token there, so we're gonna skip that. The next thing it's gonna say is if there's an experience token here, take the experience token, put it on your adventure tracker sheet under the experience section and continue reading. And then it's gonna say, do you have the keyword kidnap? You're going to look over and see, do you have the keyword kidnap? Nope, don't have it, so you're going to move on to the next section. It's going to say, do you have the keyword stealthy? Nope, I don't have it. Then it may say something like, do you have the title rescue the brother? And you go, wait, I got the title rescue the brother. So you're going to do exactly what that section is going to say. It's going to say something like, go to C5. You're going to pull out section C5. You're going to read C5, and it's going to give you some more possible options right there. But let's say we don't have that title either. Then it's going to say, continue to read. So it's gonna go on to say something like, you walk into the knoll camp, stealthy as possible. You see a couple guards standing around the edge of the camp. As you traverse around the camp, you set off an alarm. As you run to the side of the camp, the knolls charge you. You now must have an encounter with the knolls. Fight the knolls, succeed with the combat with the knolls, and you're gonna to go to section C9. Fail your encounter with the knolls, you're gonna to go to section C10. It's the basic flow of the game. That's going to how it's going to have to go. And it's basically how it's going to occur and how the events are going to occur. And that's the flow of the entire game. But now that you understand that flow, I can actually explain to you how we're going to do these things. I'm going to break it down to how we're going to do skill checks. I'm going to break down how we're going to rest. I'm going to break down how we're going to do actually adventure encounters. I'm going to break down how we're going to do enemy encounters. Then we're going to wrap things up with a campaign tracker leveling up and show you exactly how we're going to go ahead and do all those things. What I'm not gonna cover, because I'm trying to minimize the spoilers though, is I'm not gonna cover exact specifics like where the stuff is occurring at. I'm just gonna tell you how to do these kind of things. Before we go any further though, we gotta get a little bit spoiler here, but not too spoilery because you don't know where these cards are coming from. But I do explain to you how to use items in the game. Whenever you get the option in a storyline that says, do you want to use an item, you can look at all the items that are carried by the party. Now items are gonna basically come from the discovery deck and items are gonna be shared by the entire party. For example, I may have this item right here. I'm not gonna flip it over, although I guess there's already a spoiler on the front. Sorry guys and gals, can't help it. Or we're gonna have a little bit of spoilers here, but basically every single item is gonna have a number on it. So this is item 73, this is item number 98. Additionally, every one of these items may possibly have a stamina cost attached to it to go ahead and use it. So anytime you're at a section of the storybook that says, do you want to use an item? You may use one and or two items and you can combine all the items you have in any order you want. The trick here is every time you're doing this, it may possibly cost you stamina. So for example, if I want to use the potion of purification and I happen to be at location C on this map, let's get rid of that experience token. I would go ahead and look at this adventure book in section C73. But before I do so, I must take one point of stamina and the interesting thing about taking stamina in your fatigue section, I haven't covered this yet, but this is a big trick with the game. If your fatigue is ever equal to your health, you're knocked unconscious. Granted, you can get your health back and you can get your fatigue down, but if anything ever causes these tokens to move over here, your decisions may do that, or you take damage, or if your fatigue mount ever equals your health, you're knocked unconscious. Remember, if your entire party has their fatigue equal to their health, they're knocked unconscious. Now, the nice thing is your fatigue can never go greater than your health. So let's say you happen to have 15 fatigue. Something tells you to take four more points of fatigue and you only have 16 health. Well, even though it tells you to take four more, you're actually only gonna take one more because you never take more fatigue than your health. You're gonna go to the 16, the remaining three are just gonna basically be discarded back into the tray. You're not going to get them and you're gonna be knocked unconscious. Again, if your whole party's knocked unconscious, don't forget we're gonna to have to go over to the unconscious section of the storybook to figure out exactly what is gonna happen. But to go ahead and use an item, if it has any stamina cost, every single person in the party must go ahead and take this. So if this was a four player game, that means that everybody in the party, since this has a one stamina cost on it, would have to take one stamina from the tray over here 
and place it in their fatigue section. If we're only playing a one-player game, only one person has to do it. If there's no stamina cost to do so, you pretty much want to do this as much as possible because it may unlock extra story things. Now what you're basically going to do is you're going to look at your current section and the item and you're going to try to find that in your section of the storybook. So if I want to use the potion of purification at the Knoll Camp, I would go to C section number 73 in this specific adventure book. But if I wanted to combine two items together, what I'm going to do is I'm going to suffer the stamina cost of all the items involved. So let's say this chisel would cost four stamina and this would cost one stamina. I'd have to spend five stamina and everybody in the party would have to do so. And then I'm going to turn to section C7398. Now when it comes to this, when you're using multiple items together, you're going to put the items in order from lowest to highest. So if I have an item 50, a 73 and a 98, and I would use that item 50 and that 98 item together, I would go to section C, 50, 98. If I want to use the item 50 and this potion right here, I would go to C, 50, 73. If I want to use a potion of purification with the chisel, I would go to C, 73, 98, of course, after spending the stamina. That's basically how you use items. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of these items because again, I'm trying to minimize all the spoilers on this tutorial video. So before we go into cover skill checks and combat, let's go ahead and discuss resting because resting is something you're gonna do quite often in this game. It's gonna be one of the ways we're gonna get our fatigue down and make sure our fatigue doesn't literally bring us down into unconsciousness. So the very first thing we're gonna do when we're doing a rest action is we need to check a few things. First of all, the storyline needs to allow us to rest. We can't just rest anytime we want to. There's two conditions that must be met. First, the storyline must give us the option to rest. And the second thing is our rest token must be currently face up. If our rest token is currently shown the X side right here, we are not able to take the rest action. As long as it is currently face up like this, we are more than welcome to take the rest action where you can go ahead and get some of our resources back, including getting down our fatigue and also getting our statistics back that we can use to go ahead and manipulate these dice because the more fatigue we get, again, the closer we are getting to going unconscious. So the first thing we're gonna do when we decide to do a rest action is we need to decide exactly how much experience points we wanna spend on the rest action. And to do so, we're simply gonna take experience points from our experience pool and we're going to discard these experience tokens back to the tray. And then we're gonna roll a certain amount of dice based on the total amount of experience we just discarded. Now this is gonna be really important because if we got lots of stamina, the amount of stamina we're gonna get back is gonna be based on the roll of the dice. So if I decide to discard two experience points, that means I get to grab two dice out of the bag and I'm gonna roll these dice. And that's gonna be how much fatigue I get to remove from my current character right here. So I'm gonna take, in this case I rolled a six, I'm gonna take six fatigue, remove it from here, and put it back in the tray. Let's go ahead and take a slightly better number so we can see exactly how this works or let's take a worse number because hey, that's just how things work. So taking my wonderful roll of five, let's go ahead and remove five stamina cubes right here. We're gonna take these five stamina cubes and we're gonna put them back on the tray. Now as you play the game more, you're gonna kind of bypass this step and you'll see exactly why in just a second. But the total amount we roll is gonna be go back into the tray and the dice we rolled are gonna go back in the dice bag. Then we're gonna go ahead and refill our statistics up to our current maximums. And if there's anything that's beyond this maximum, we're actually going to reduce it. So for example, if I currently had three cubes right here, I would actually have to drop it back down to two because resting resets us all the way back to our current maximum. So let's go ahead and grab out two cubes right here for our strength. Oops, that's the wrong size cubes. Let's go ahead and do two cubes for our strength. We'll do two for our constitution. We will do three for our, keep grabbing the wrong size cubes, that's not fun. Three for our wisdom and then one for our charisma. After we refilled all of our statistics, we're gonna see if we have any cards in the spent column. Now the way cards go in the spent column is you're gonna see this symbol right here, which looks like an up arrow. Anytime we play these cards with this up arrow, they go into our spent column. If they don't have that symbol on, they're gonna go into our discard column unless they happen to have the symbol on that says once per adventure. Now I can't show you any of those cards because those are all rare cards. Again, I'm trying to minimize spoilers, but basically it looks like a book that has been opened with the number one on it. If you see that symbol, you can only use that card once per adventure. It stays in your hand at the end of the adventure, you're gonna going to get it back, but it's only usable once per adventure. But to finish our rest symbol, any of the cards in our spent column are simply going to go back into our hand and we're gonna gain those cards back. Additionally, if we spent our special class ability, and this is signified by being flipped over just like that, we will go ahead and refresh our class ability as now usable and we now have access to our class ability again. After all that is done, we will flip over our rest token, letting us know that we don't have access to the rest action anymore until we manage to reset that. Now the way that's gonna reset that is by succeeding or actually I should say completing a skill challenge or an encounter challenge. So we can reset it, but if that token is ever face up with the X on it, even if the story says, do you wanna take the rest action? If that X is currently face up, then we can't take the rest action even if it's being offered 
offered to us by the storybook. And now we get to skill challenges. Now skill challenges are going to be very unique and they're going to be based on difficulty levels and they're also generally going to be based on your certain statistics. So you're going to basically know what you're getting into before you start the skill challenge. For example, if you want to do a charm test, you're probably pretty sure it's going to involve charisma. If you want to do an endurance check, there's probably a good chance it's going to involve constitution. If you want to do a fight, it's probably going to involve strength. Not guaranteed, but that's pretty much what's going to happen. So what it's going to say is you're going to do a skill challenge based on a certain keyword. So to do so, you're simply going to pull out the skill challenge book right here, which is going to be called the skill book right here. And you're simply going to open it to the skill challenge that you've been told to do. For example, we've been told that we're going to do a charm challenge. We're going to turn to the charm page. We're told that we need to do interpretation. We're going to turn to interpretation. And this is all in alphabetical order, so it should be pretty easy to find. So let's say we were told that we need to do a persuasion skill check. Then it's going to tell us the level of the skill check with a Roman numeral after the skill check. So for example, it may say persuasion two. That means that our skill check is going to be based on this column right here. It said persuasion four is going to be based on this skill column right over here. But let's make, take it easy on our level one character and say that we need to do a persuasion skill level one challenger, which is going to be listed right here. We're going to see that it's going to require purple and red to succeed. We need threes and ones to succeed. Sorry, a three and a couple ones to succeed. And we're going to get a total of four dice for this encounter. Very important thing to understand about this game. Skill challenges are going to tell you how many dice you get. When you go into combat, the amount of dice you're going to get is going to be based on your combat level. So that's kind of two key points to make sure you understand about this game. So now that we've figured out exactly what our skill challenges is, we need to go ahead and work on using our abilities to try to get these dice to be in our favor hopefully very quickly. So now we get to build our dice pool. Now the dice pool is going to be built from the Book of Adventures dice, I'm sorry, not the Book of Adventures, but the Dice of Adventures dice bag. And that's where we're going to be drawing our dice out. And the amount of dice we're going to draw again has already been decided by the skill challenge we're doing. We're going to get four dice in a specific dice challenge. But we want to get purple and red dice. How do we guarantee we do that? Well, we do that by spending our statistics. Now the way we're going to do that is we can discard a dice, I'm sorry, cubes of stamina from our attributes into our fatigue and the amount of cubes we discard is going to give us an actual choice of the dice we're going to draw from the bag. If we don't do this, the dice colors are going to come out of going to be 100% random. This is going to be how we're going to mitigate that challenge. So the amount of fatigue we need to take to get a specific color out of the bag is going to be based on the amount of players that are currently in the game. So in a one player game, it's going to be one fatigue. In a four player game, it's going to be four fatigue. Now this can be taken from anybody at the table. For example, if it's a strength challenge and I'm playing a two player game, I can go ahead and sacrifice all my strength to go ahead and get that extra choice. Or we can split it among all the players. But the amount of colors we're going to get is going to be based on the color wheel that happens to be right here. So if I want a red die, I need to spend strength. If I want a black die, I need to spend dexterity. Uh oh, I have a zero dexterity. How do I do it when I don't have that stat? Well, if you don't have a stat, you can spend up to three cubes from your other stats, again, among all the players at the table, to go ahead and represent that one stat, again, times the amount of players. So if I need to get a black die really badly, and I'm playing this game right now, showing this one player right here, and I want to get a black die to make this challenge succeed, I can discard three cubes from anywhere else from any of my stats, or another player at the table can help me do that. So for example, let's say I'm playing a two-player game, I can spend two of my constitution, and then another player at the table can spend one stat from any stat besides the black stat, their dexterity statistic, spend that one cube, and that's going to allow me to draw one cube, one black die from the bag right there. So what you're going to be drawing is going to be based on how much you want to sacrifice. So if you want to get a color, a specific color, you need to discard one cube per player at the table of that matching color, or three colors or three of any color to go ahead to do that times the amount of players at the table. So in a really horrible, horrible example, let's say we need a green die super duper badly. We're playing a four player game right now. Nobody has any constitution stamina cubes available. So that means we're playing a four player game. We need to have a total of 12 cubes from all the players at the table. One person can sacrifice six, one person can sacrifice three, another person can sacrifice two, another person can sacrifice one to get a total of 12 cubes into all of our joint fatigues, our own individual fatigue columns, to go ahead and get that one green die. Yes, if you don't have the specific statistic, it can be extremely challenging to go ahead and get the dice you want out of that bag. So let's go ahead and reset this challenge for our plucky little hero who is not liking the odds being stacked against them already. And we see in this challenge that we need red and we need purple. So we have a one player game, so it's one cube per red die we want to draw from the bag. 
So I'm going to go ahead and discard two red or two strength cubes, which is going to allow me to go into the bag and actually pick out two red dice. I'm not going to get them random. I'm going to get two red dice because I get to choose those red dice. I also know that I need at least one purple die. I can go for gambling and hope a purple die goes out, or I can spend stamina. One player game, I'm going to spend one cube right now, and let's go ahead and look through the bag, and we're going to pull out one purple die now right there. I'm done spending these cubes. I could continue to go ahead and get another one. For example, if I want one more purple, I could go ahead and discard all three of these whites, but I don't think it's really worth it. So now that we know this is a skill challenge involving four dice, now I need to draw randomly until I hit the total amount for the skill check. If this was a skill check of 10 dice, and I only pulled out three, the other seven dice are going to be totally random. Since this is a four dice check, I'm just simply going to reach in the bag, randomly pull out one die, and we're going to pull those dice out one at a time, and we're going to see that I now have a black die. So now that I have a total of four dice, now I can go ahead and do my skill check by just rolling these dice, and then hopefully they're going to be in my favor. We're going to do some manipulation, and maybe we're going to succeed at the skill challenge. So I'll roll, and we will get a 3, a 5, a 5, and a 5. Not really looking that good right now. Not looking that good at all. If we look over here at our skill challenge requirements right here, we see that we need a red or a purple 1. We need a red 1, and we need a purple 3. I did not get any of those things. So how do I fix that problem? Well, I fix that problem by manipulating the dice by going ahead and spending my cards. The trick here is the amount of cards that I can play out of my hand, even though I may have a hand of 40 cards, not going to happen on a first level character, but the amount of cards I can play is going to be based on the campaign tracker. Remember, the campaign tracker tells us the maximum amount of cards that we can ever play per character, plus there's always a bonus card that's usable by one person. If you have multiple tokens, then multiple people can take that token. So since I'm playing a one player game, that means I can only play four cards total out of my hand to go ahead and manipulate those dice. So we see that I have this one right here. This symbol means right here, re-roll any red or any white die at all. I'm not gonna cover all these symbols. All of these symbols are listed on the last page of the rule book, way beyond the goal of this video to cover all these. Plus it'll bore you to tears. This one I can see that I can take any three or five and I can flip them to the other side. So I can turn a three to a four, I can turn a five to a two. I can make that any color. So I can change a black five into a two. I can turn that black or that red five into a two and turn that red three into a four. Don't know if that's gonna help me or not. I have obnoxious, which allows me to treat any die of any color as a purple or a white die. It's not gonna change his face, but I can make him play any one of those slots. This tower shield says I can take up to two dice, because I have two blue dice symbols right here, and I can manipulate each one of them up to two by raising them, one of them by one, or lowering them by one. Can't do that to both, I can't do the same thing to both of them. So for example, just to explain that a little bit better to pull out two blue dice right here. If I had two blue dice like this, let's make it like this. I can raise this one from three to four. I can lower this one from six to five to complete that card. I could not, so let's go back to the original example here. Let's say I had three and six like this. I could not raise this one by two to bring it up to five because you only manipulate each die one time. And I can only just do one or both or neither depending on how I play that card, just so I understand that one. This one says I can decrease a red or a white die by one or two. Well, that card may help me. This one says that I can add a red die and then I can add another red die. There's a good one. And this one says I can pull out any random die from the bag and it's going to come out on a three. I'm not going to go ahead and roll that die. It has to be a three. So let's see how we can use these dice to go ahead and make things come out in our favor. So I'm going to go ahead and spend the Tremor card first. Remember, I have a maximum amount of four cards I can play because I'm playing a one-player game. Plus, I do have the bonus token. So technically, since I'm playing this by myself, I can play up to five cards for a skill check. So let's go ahead and do Tremor first. So I'm going to reach in the bag. It tells me I'm going to get red dice. So I'm going to draw two red dice, and I'm going to roll both these red dice. I'm going to get a one and a two. Let's go and add this one and this two over here to our pile of dice that we are currently manipulating. And it looks like we're getting a little bit closer to go ahead and maybe succeed in this challenge. I still have three cards I can play though. Next up, let's go ahead and spend the Blessed Mace. The Blessed Mace says I can decrease a red or a white die by one or two. Well, let's go and look at our dice over here. I do have a red die. Let's go and decrease that from a two down to a one. I've now spent two of my four cards that are available to me. And of course, as I'm spending these cards, if they don't have the symbol here, they're gonna go in my discard pile. They have this symbol right here that are going to go into my spent pile. And the only way those are gonna come back in my hand is by doing a rest action. 
Let's see if I have any other dice that are going to allow me to win this competition right here. Well, it looks like I actually do have one more die that's going to allow me to succeed right here. Spending my third of my possible four cards right here, I'm going to spend the card Obnoxious. Now, Obnoxious says I can treat any color die as a purple or a white. Well, let's go ahead and see how that's going to manipulate things by going ahead and looking at our skill book over here right now. I can turn any single die and treat it as a purple. So I can treat this as a purple three because of my Obnoxious card. I have this one right here, and then I have this one right here. Look at that, I managed to succeed in my skill challenge by playing all my cards. So now that we've completed the skill challenge, all the dice that are using the skill challenge, all of them are gonna go back into the bag. And then we will gain rewards based on what's listed right here. Generally speaking, this is experience points you're gonna gain. And most of the time, it's just gonna be two experience points. You're gonna take the gain depending on which one of these you've succeeded in. So to carry over my prior example, if for example, I had only succeeded right here, and I only succeeded right here, but I didn't quite get a die to match that up, I'm only going to gain one experience. Since I completed the entire challenge and that section was covered right there, I'm going to gain two experience points. You're simply going to gain the experience points and then you're gonna take them and you're gonna add them over to your campaign tracker and you've already seen one of the ways we spend our experience points and that's for the rest action. After we have completed that challenge, whether pass or fail, we're gonna take any cards that happen to be in our discard pile, not the spent cards, but any cards in our discard pile that are gonna go back into our hand and then we're gonna move on to the storybook depending on if we pass the skill challenge by filling in all the squares or we failed by not filling all of them and the book is gonna tell us where to go. It'll say like pass A12, fail A13, and we're gonna continue reading the storyline. The good news though is anytime we do a skill challenge, whether we pass or fail, it doesn't matter if we pass or succeed or not, but every time we do it, we will flip our rest token back to the rest side. Let us know that we do have the rest action available to us as long as the book is allowing us to do so. That's the important thing. You can't just rest whenever you want to. The book has to give you the option to rest. If it gives you the option to rest, you can go ahead and take that rest action now at that point. So now we've seen how to do a skill challenge. Let's go ahead and look at how we're gonna do a combat test. Now there's two different kinds of combats that we're gonna have in the game. We're gonna have our standard combats, for example, against this hapless little bandit. And then we may have our modified combats. Anytime we have a modified combat, we're gonna look through the status deck, which is a small deck of cards right here, which shows modifiers. And we're gonna apply that modifier to this combat and to this combat only. Now some of these modifiers help us, and a lot of these modifiers make life a lot more challenging for us, but they're basically gonna give us some different modifiers to this combat. For example, this one, if we were fighting a weakened bandit, we would see that skill cards do not count against the play limit. Remember, the play limit for one player game is four, so standard fight, I can only play four total cards for a combat, plus my bonus card if I do use my bonus token. But since it's a weakened one, I can play my entire hand. If I have 40 cards, I'm gonna play all 40 of those cards to make sure I win this fight. So now we have the basics for the start of our combat. Let's go and explain how we're gonna do our battles and how combat's going to work. So the first thing we need to do is we need to assign a round tracker to this combat. Every single combat is gonna last for exactly three rounds. At the end of the third round, if we haven't defeated the enemy yet, then the counter is gonna be considered a failure. If we manage to defeat the enemy before the end of the third round, it's gonna be a success for our heroes. So the very first thing we wanna do is we're gonna look at all the statuses and we're gonna try to figure out exactly what we're trying to accomplish here. In this specific example, we're trying to get a white two, a blue three, and any color five and a red three. At the bottom of every one of these sections, you're gonna see on the left-hand side, the damage that's gonna to occur to us every round until that square has been filled in. On the right-hand side, you're gonna see the bonus we're gonna get at the end of the combat if we manage to fill that square in. Additionally, every single round, we're also going to have an additional penalty that's applied to us at the end of the round. And it's gonna be the penalty that's currently showing. So for example, at the end of round one, this is our penalty. At the end of round two, this is our penalty. And then the round three, well, there's no additional penalty except for the fact that we've lost the combat. So maybe that's a worse penalty than what we had to deal with in the first place. So now that we've seen what we're dealing with, we gotta start building our dice pool again. Let's go ahead and look back at our character sheet. So just like your typical skill check, we're gonna be building dice from our dice pool out of the adventure bag right here. Based on any of the statistics, stamina, we're gonna spend to go ahead and make sure we're gonna get dice in our favor. Here's the trick, unlike a skill challenge, which tells us how many dice we're gonna get for the skill challenge, in combat is different. The amount of dice we're gonna get in combat every single round is gonna be based on our current combat value. And again, that is gonna be tracked on our campaign tracker. So for example, in our starting campaign right here, remember our combat value is level three. That can go up by spending experience points at the end of adventures, but for our current combat, it's currently set to three. Remember, we need four dice to defeat this guy. Yep, you can see how this early combat is probably gonna go for our heroes. Luckily, we do have the ability to draw extra red dice. And since we do have the ability to draw extra red dice, that may influence which dice we're gonna take out of the bag right here in the beginning. 
because we know we need blue, we need white, we need red, and we basically need any color at all. Well, I can get two red dice just by playing a card, so I'm not too worried about getting the red. I'm worried again about getting the white, blue, and the any color. So to go ahead and get the white, I'm thinking that I will spend one stamina right here to go ahead and draw one white die out of the bag. Again, we get a choice because I spent the stamina, one player game, only need to spend one. I need to get blue. I do not have any blue, don't have any intelligence at all. So I'm gonna spend three stamina from other abilities to go ahead and get one blue die. I'm gonna go ahead and spend one here. I'm gonna spend one from right here, and I will spend one from right here. I spent a total of three, which is allowing me to draw one blue intelligence die out of the bag right now. Now I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go from random because I don't wanna spend any more stamina because I'm gonna do this whole process every single round and I wanna control the dice and pull out every single round. So the third combat die, remember I only got three combat dice due to my statistic, is gonna be a random draw from the bag. So I'm gonna draw randomly and I will get red. I didn't want red, I was hoping for anything but red because I have cards that can really help me. Not really what I wanted, but hey, that's the fun of the game. So now I'm gonna go ahead and roll my dice. And then we're gonna go ahead and spend some skill cards and go ahead and see if we modify that. Now remember, just like a skill check, every single person in your party can spend the total amount of cards based on the play limit. So if we were playing a four player game, that means that every single player can play cards up to their play limit. Since we're playing a one player game, only the one person can play cards up to their play limit. Remember, my play limit is normally four, but don't forget this bandit is weakened. So that means that I can ignore the play limit and I can go ahead and play my entire hand of cards. I might be able to defeat this guy at the very, very first round. If I can't do it, I'm gonna go ahead and not do it because I want you to see how combat works from round to round to round. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna spend this tremor card, which is going to allow me to draw three red dice out of the bag. One red die. I almost want to break into the counter. One red die, ah, uh, ah, uh, two red dice. I will roll and I will get a five and I will get a four. Well, that five is gonna help me immensely. This doesn't help me at all. So, so far the only thing I've succeeded in is I managed to do that as one success and that doesn't help me at all. So I need to start manipulating these dice right here. So let's look at our hand or our cards that we got right here. I'm gonna go ahead and play the Blessed Mace, which is a discard card, not a spent card, which allows me to decrease a red or white die by one or two. I will go ahead and decrease this from a four down to a three. That satisfies two of our requirements right here. Now I need to spend this Chain Gorget, which also has the additional ability that when you spend multiple, I'll make sure you're reading the abilities of these cards, they don't count towards your play limit when you play multiple of those. So I'm gonna go ahead and re-roll this white die, and I will get a three. Still not what I need. I think, I think we're gonna be done just because I wanna show you exactly how it works when you actually don't win one combat round. So you start seeing how the damage is going to occur. But let's go ahead and apply these dice to our horrible weakened bandit right now. So the first thing we will do is we'll apply the red to three right here, and then we'll play the five as a multicolor right here. I don't have a way to take care of the white two or the blue three, so that's not going to occur. So now we're going to go ahead and suffer the damage of what's gonna happen. For every single dice that's not covered, we're gonna take that much damage and stamina from the pool. So we're gonna see we're gonna take three stamina damage plus three stamina damage, and that's gonna be your entire party. So this was a four player game. That'd be six stamina to every single person in our party. Yes, combat can be very, very brutal if you're not careful. So let's go ahead and take six stamina. I will use the big cubes to go ahead and represent this, and we'll see that we have six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I'm one stamina from being knocked unconscious. That means I cannot spend any more stamina here, because if I do, I'm gonna be defeated. Except actually, technically, nope, I'm not defeated. I better double check that just really quick because there's one other penalty we need to suffer. Let's go ahead and look back at our bandit card. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna suffer the penalty based on the current round that is currently shown. So we're gonna see that we would normally lose one gold. Well, I don't in this playthrough have any gold in this example, so that effect will not affect us. So we're simply going to advance to round number two and we're gonna start the entire combat round process all the way over from the beginning again, back from going ahead and selecting our cubes, our dice out of the bag. So since we currently have 15 stamina, that means I cannot spend any stamina at all to go ahead and help us with this encounter. Because if I spend one more, I'm gonna be knocked unconscious and we're gonna fail this fight. So I need to draw three dice randomly from the back. So let's go ahead and see what kind of fun we're gonna get. So the first thing we're gonna get is we will get a white. Hey, that's a good start. Next thing we'll get is we will get a blue. Hey, there's another good start. And we'll finally, we'll get a, whoa, another blue. Nice. So. 
Let's go ahead and roll all three of these dice. I need a blue three and a white two. Almost got it. So close, so darn close. Is there anything we can do to go ahead and manipulate these dice by looking at our cards that we have out right now? Well, you know what? No. Well, darn it. Actually, we can possibly make this work. So let me show you how we're going to play a combination of different effects. Remember, I have unlimited cards I can play. Do that weekend stat. So I'm going to play Exile, which is a spent card. I'm going to go ahead and reach in the bag, and I'm going to pull out any die at all, and I'm going to set it to a number three. Next up, I'm going to play my Tower Shield. This actually worked out perfectly, which allows me to lower any blue die by one. I'm going to lower this from a three down to a two. And then I'm going to spend Obnoxious, which allows me to take any die and apply it as any other color. So let's go and look at our board over here and see exactly how that's going to work out. So remember, I can play any color as any other color or turn any color into a white. So this blue is effectively a white two. And I already got the red or the blue three, so I now have completed this encounter. Since I was managed to successfully complete this encounter, now I'm going to gain the rewards based on everything that's listed on this die or the cover up die. So I'm gonna gain one gold, plus two more gold, which still is a three, plus two more is five gold, plus one experience point. I would take all that, and I put that in community party rewards, and then we're gonna take all the dice and place them back in the bag. The weakened status and the enemy creatures are gonna go back into this section. And again, if the party 10 had been flipped over to his X side, I can now go ahead, go ahead and refresh it, meaning that now we can take the rest action as long as the rest action is available to us. After that, the only thing left to do is we're going to gain back any of our discarded cards that are going to go back into our hand. Remember, spent cards are going to stay there until we do the rest action. It's the only way to get those spent cards back. It's also the only way to get our class ability back, which I haven't flipped it over, so I haven't used it yet. So we're doing pretty darn good here. But looking at all of our fatigue in this example, our hero definitely wants to go ahead and do a rest action as quickly as possible. Because one more point of fatigue, and we're going unconscious. So that is how we're going to do the complete combat. Again, refresh, make sure we're refreshing that camp token. And if we succeed in the combat by defeating the creature, we're going to look in the story book and tell us what section to go to. If we fail the combat, it's also going to tell us what section to go to. That's basically how you do all the skill checks. That's how you do the resting. That's how you do the combat in the game. The only thing left to do is tell you what to do when we end an adventure and we decide that we are going to level up. At the end of every adventure, we're going to get the chance to level up. Now, the way most of your adventures are going to end is going to come to a section of the book that says, at this point, you may go to the end, which is going to be the final couple pages of that specific adventure book. Now, you don't always have to go to the end. Most of the adventures are going to give you the chance to continue to explore the map. If you decide to continue to explore the map, anytime you're given the move option, you can, instead of moving, go to the end section of the storybook. But as long as you don't do that, you can keep exploring. And in this example, we could continue to go to all these different locations, unlock all the stories, see all the plot points and story points. But remember, your decisions are permanent and may also make different changes to the map. So don't think that you're going to see everything on every single playthrough. Because by making your decisions and choosing your paths, things are going to be locked to you. And there's things that you can't actually get story-wise. Because it'll say something like, did you burn down the troll hut? Okay, when you go to this hut location, guess what? The troll hut is burned down. You can't actually explore that troll hut. So that's basically how that storyline is going to work. But remember, you don't have to go to the actual end until you decide to, unless the adventure specifically tells you you have to. At the end of every single adventure, though, things we need to do is we need to take all the discovery cards that have any map tiles, put them back in the discovery deck. If there's any keywords we manage to go ahead and obtain, we're going to go ahead and just erase those all from our campaign tracker. If there's any discoveries that we manage to get that are items, we're also going to go back in the discovery deck. Any titles we manage to keep are we're going to keep over on the campaign tracker for all the titles. Any rare cards we manage to get are going to stay in our hand, especially if they specifically tell us to keep them in our hand. And yes, most of them you're going to keep in your hand. And then basically we're going to put the map away and we're going to go ahead and move on to the next adventure and set up. But before we do that, we need to do some cleanup on our campaign tracker. The first thing we're going to do on our campaign tracker is we're going to mark off the story that we just completed. And then we're going to go ahead and get some adventure cards that we can go ahead and purchase. Now the way this is going to work for the purchasing of the adventure cards is we're going to pull out the stack of the armor, the skills, the traits, the scrolls, and all those different stacks of cards that are going to be available to us. We're going to randomly draw one card from every single stacks of cards, and that's going to be our available market. Once we've got our market cards set up, and all these cards have different costs on them, some of them have bonuses, some of them have extra abilities, and these are cards that we're going to purchase and put in our hand by spending the gold that we have. Now, most of these cards are going to have a set, card, a set cost in the upper right-hand corner. I'm not pulling them out, trying to minimize spoilers again. 
but some of them are also gonna have discounts on them. Some will say like discount wisdom, which means that the player who buys that card, the cost for them is gonna be the cost listed minus their current maximum wisdom statistic. Someone may say that if your race is happens to be dark out for you at minus two of the cost, whatever it happens to be, but we're gonna spend the gold for that. But before we do that, we get to spend our experience. Now experience is gonna be spent to raise up our attributes, Experience is going to be raised to raise up our play card limit. Experience will raise our combat dice limit. And experience is going to raise up our bonus play limit. All of this is listed on page 17 of the rule book, and it goes over all the costs. It's pretty darn self-explanatory. Basically, the minimum cost is going to be cost to go ahead and raise up those different things. The big thing to understand is that the mastery track right here to raise your statistics, you'll spend three experience points, mark that off, and everybody gets to raise one of their statistics by one. The trick here is that nobody at this point can have a score limit on their bonus greater than four until we get to this next section, the score limit six, and you can kind of read across and figure out how that works right here. After we spent all of our experience, and we don't have to spend it all, any that's left over, we're simply going to discard, and we're gonna write down in our save column to signify how much experience we have left over, and then we're gonna go ahead and spend our gold on the market cards that we selected. Now you can buy some, none, or all those market cards, and the community gold is gonna be used to purchase those cards, but you're gonna give one of those cards to one of the players who's going to actually buy that card. Any cards that we don't buy are going to be discarded back in the hand, and any gold that we have left over, we're simply going to write down under the save column, and we'll carry that over to the next adventure. The final thing we need to do is we need to mark down where our current favors happen to be for our different factions at the end of the adventure. So for example, if our Starlit Door favor go all the way down to the four right here, we remove the cube, and then we put a simple little check mark there, signifying that's where it's at. If our King's favor got all the way up to six, again, we would just remove that and put that down here like that. And that's basically how we're going to track these things from adventure to adventure to adventure. At the start of the next adventure, when we start it, we're simply going to place the cube there and erase the mark. That way we can track these values from adventure to adventure. And we're simply going to keep building this up and going from adventure, going through the entire campaign. So this has been a very long, sorry, long-winded tutorial on how to play role-play adventures. This was a little bit longer than I wanted it to be, but that's because I was trying to be so darn avoiding of spoilers. I'm sure if I would have pulled out the spoilers, I could have cut this video in half. But I want this to be a video that everybody can watch because I know when it comes to story games, we hate spoilers. Why do you want the spoilers for an adventure game? Because that's the idea, going through the adventure. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed this video series. If you have any comments or questions, make sure you leave them down in the YouTube comments down below. I will definitely answer them as quickly as I can. You can also feel free to email me, authorshelf board game reviews. That is otsbgr at gmail.com. I will do my darndest to answer your question as quickly as I can. If you enjoyed this video, if you enjoy the content I put out there, think about supporting the channel over on Patreon. Just one dollar in the tip jar can help me cover my costs. Remember, this channel is 100% sponsor free. All the content and everything you see out there is purchased by myself and my gaming group to help bring out content for all of you to enjoy. We don't get free copies of games. We are buying these games just like you to bring them out to the table so you can see these wonderful games, learn how to play them, and see if these are going to be games that will be great for your gaming group. Hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you enjoyed this video series. Make sure you click that like button, click that subscribe button, because your subscriptions do matter. And as always, thanks for watching.